Thank you, Ambassador Williamson and Dr. Farkas for a fascinating discussion on the ACA international justice, what, what Ambassador Van Scott called at the beginning, our Nuremberg moment, um, and, and for all your work uh, in prosecuting war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, Clint, Ambassador Williamson mentioned Lviv, and I would recommend a book about the birth of international criminal justice that started in Lviv, East West Street by Philip Sands. Now we're on to our live panel, so stay with us. Um, we'll see a very short video. It's only three minutes and 28 seconds. Uh, this is uh, reporter and investigator Maria Adiva, who recorded this specifically for this event. She couldn't join us in person because she's in the field right now recording and reporting uh, what is happening in her home country. After this very short video, we'll dive right into a live panel and there will be audience Q&A in the Q&A function here on the webinar. So get your questions ready and send them when you want. So in this three minute and 28 second video, you'll see evidence of a possible war crime, intentionally directing an attack against a building dedicated to education. So this is a school, for those keeping track, it's Article 829B of the Rome Statute, intentionally directing an attack against a building dedicated to education, a school. So here are the facts, as Maria, recorded this video for us, related to us, uh, and as she knows them to be. The school behind her will be Kharkiv Gymnasium number 47. 680 children had been studying there. It was destroyed on the 4th of July. The missiles were fired from the territory of Russia, Belgorod Oblast. Here's the video. Hi, my name is Maria Avdeeva. I am a researcher of Russian disinformation and security expert, and also resident of Kharkiv. When the invasion started on the 24th of February, I decided to stay in Kharkiv and document Russian war crimes. Since that time, I go out on the streets of Kharkiv, film the aftermath of Russian attacks on civilian infrastructure. I also have traveled around Ukraine uh, covering the situation in Donbass, in the south, in Kherson and in Donetsk regions of Ukraine. Uh, this is very important that the world knows and sees what atrocities Russia commits in Ukraine. Just recently, Ukrainian army was able to liberate almost the whole territory of Kharkiv region. And every day since that, I am traveling around Kharkiv to see and to witness what has been done during the Russian occupation. You, of course, have heard about the mass grave near Izum. Uh, in the forest, more than 400 graves with the numbers on them were found. And now the police in Kharkiv region and the experts are working on exhumating the bodies to detect what caused the deaths and then find and uh, held accountable those responsible. For now, it is known that most of the bodies have signs of violent death. It means that people were either killed uh, by the Russians uh, or they died because of the shelling or because they didn't have uh, any medical help or assistance because they were hiding in the basements. So I have basically turned from the researcher of disinformation uh, to someone who works now in the fields uh, because when my country is fighting with Russian aggression, I think that this is important for me to be on the ground to see, to witness and to report on what I see and hear. Behind me, you see one of the hundred schools here in Kharkiv that were destroyed by the Russian attacks. Just today I woke up at two at the night because four uh, smirch missiles hit a Kharkiv a residential area in Kharkiv just less than two kilometers from where I live. And this happens every day and that is why it's so important to continue supporting Ukraine to continue pushing the governments to provide Ukraine more military help because with the more weapons, high precise weapons, with more supplies, Ukrainian army will be pushing forward Russians out of the territory of Ukraine and we will be able, Ukraine will be able to win this war faster. 
thank you everyone who is continuing supporting my country this is so important for us and for the whole world Slava Ukraine that video for those of you, you just tuning in sorry that was Kharkiv gymnasium number 47 680 children had been studying there it was destroyed on the 4th of July and it could be a possible evidence of a war crime under the Rome statute article 829b for those keeping track Maria Deva recorded that video for us on September 21st and she can't join us because she is um recording and reporting on what is happening in her home country i recommend very briefly before going into our live panel they're all here right now thank you for joining us i recommend maria's cnn exclusive investigation of an alleged russian war criminal colonel general alexander shurivayov who is alleged to have committed atrocity crimes in syria and who is now allegedly committing them in ukraine it's a great investigation i really recommend it it's called russian general who oversaw atrocities in syria lead cluster bomb attacks and civilians in Ukraine it's from May of this year if you want to Google it okay so now we have a very distinguished life panel to talk us through all these things it is my honor to introduce Natalia Subar the chair of the Maiden Monitoring Information Center Roman Avramenko the executive director of Truth Hounds Andrea Cayley the director of the Sandra Day of Connor College of Law and coordinator of EU UK US atrocity crimes advisory group what we're referring to as ACA and last but not least Scott Martin an international attorney and the founder of global justice advisors thank you again for joining us so if I may uh let's start with the video we just saw Natalia you're there in Ukraine you're very known for your work in collecting visual evidence of possible war crimes but you've been recording civil rights uh, violations and protecting the freedoms of Ukrainians for a long time. T tell us briefly what you're seeing right now uh, or since 2014 or any comments on Maria's video who I understand uh, you know so thank you. Thank you for hiring me. It's a great honor to be uh, present here. Uh, well starting uh, March 10th I just I have not only seen but I have recorded roughly 1,000 videos of the uh, hits from the air of civilian infrastructure, mostly in Kharkiv and increasingly more in Kharkiv region. My colleagues recorded another uh, 1,000 videos and we have about 20,000 uh, photos and everything is produced within the pre-trial uh, investigation conducted uh, by Ukrainian authorities, namely um, uh, Security Service of Ukraine and the police. We are called expert tripods because our function is just to hold the stick and photo or video on the stick and basically uh, record whatever the investigator ask us to that is says it so uh, i've seen a lot uh, however i stopped uh, reacting emotionally to such uh, cases and uh, i switched myself to just uh, uh, thinking all the time how to increase the quality of the evidence and the decrease the uh, quantity uh we uh, are now in the phase less is more we have now to uh, make photos and videos not only in the city where well it's a big city with good roads it's fairly easy to get somewhere but we are coming into the winter and we have to record the um, atrocities in the region which was recently liberated and it's a big challenge and that's basically what I'm doing right now and what my team is doing no thank you and I see the two prosecutors nodding as you say that and I see Roman paying close attention he does a bit something different we'll get into that and but you recorded a video not for us but you we're going to play 29 seconds of a long video you send us uh, just so we can show the audience what it means so we have Maria's video and we have your video so we're going to play 29 seconds sound off and Natalia if you can just tell us for those 29 seconds what we're seeing sure. when you recorded it and what it is so let's play the video this is a museum of um, 
18th century philosopher Grigory Skovorada somehow uh, our uh, drive away from Kharkiv. Uh, it was uh, this is my second recording of this uh, damaged uh, building. Uh, I had to get back to the crime scene because the investigator told me that my video cannot be used uh, for, a pro for the process, for the trial, because I commented it too much. I put too much emotion into commenting this video. So I had to get back and uh, all the words I am saying on this video is the date, the place and my name, that's all. Great, thank you. No, that's great. Thank you for, for sending that. Turning to the prosecutors, Andrea, I wanted to turn to you first. We just saw two videos. Uh, you were the first or one of the first American prosecutors, or American Croatian prosecutors at the ICTY. Uh, you're coordinating these groups right now. Um, you've done this for a long time. So give us and the audience maybe a brief glimpse of how a prosecutor would work with these videos, what you're doing um, and anything you want to tell us about what we're talking about. So uh, first thing I would say is that, thank you, Pedro, um, uh, is that it's been 28 years um, since the ICTY opened. So the ICTY had been the first court, the first tribunal dealing with war crimes since Nuremberg. So it was brand new. What do we do with this evidence? How do we come in? The war in Yugoslavia had been going on already for three years. So it's a different, we're here uh, with experienced people who have been working in this field for almost 30 years. Um, and who, who are on the ground as the conflict began. Um, so that has created a very different situation. The second thing, and this is the most relevant to um, Natalia and uh, Maria's work, is that this is going to be the biggest use and, uh, of technology um, of any, any conflict before. It has changed completely what war crimes, um, how war crimes are looked at and how war crimes are prosecuted. Um, Technology is rapidly transforming how these investigations of human rights abuses are carried out. Traditionally, investigations always relied upon witness testimony and on-site evidence to prove the existence of the violations. Can an online video be authenticated? <laughs> so uh, we have Maria here. We have her as a, as a witness who filmed this. We can bring her then to testify about this video and to introduce it. But what do we do with all the, the other evidence, such as the Bellingcat evidence, um, the TikTok videos or, or Instagram posts the soldiers are making? How will courts treat this? Um, the ICC has dealt with this before. Um, it's obtained um, uh, materials from, especially in the Libyan cases that were open source information. And they developed a system to look at this, to determine the reliability and the chain of custody and the contents. And that was the crucial part. Um, the ICC even has um, forensic experts who work in this field. And how do you bring in this sort of uh, evidence? Looking back to the ICTY, we had one case called Stupnido, which was a case of Croatian, Bosnian Croatian soldiers who murdered civilians in, uh, Muslim civilians in central Bosnia. That entire case was built on photographs and videos taken by Nordbat, the Nord Northern uh, Nordic Battalion of Unkafor. So this isn't brand new, but it's now a matter of uh, evidence coming in from so many different sources. And as uh, I think Maria, you said, we have to stop because there's so much, but you shouldn't stop um, in, in truth. We should find a system to, first of all, store this data in a way that cannot be hacked or changed by anybody, um, whether it be in the European Union or the, in the United States, to remove this and to find a safe storage space. And then to look at how can we determine the reliability and um, the authenticity of this material, that it hasn't been tampered um, and that it can be used in court without being um, questioned. Um, so I think this Ukraine investigation is brand new and it's opening so many legal issues um, that I, I think it's hard to comment on. I think the future is is going is very new to for all of us. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's that's very insightful as, as we expected, and it's exactly what Ambassador Ben Skak said at the beginning, right? It's the it's the uh, most recorded war crime investigation ever in history, and at the same time, it's our Nuremberg moment, right? It's it's a new moment. What we have all that experience. I saw Scott Martin nodding a lot through that. I want to give him the chance to comment 
I saw Roman also nodding. Scott, quick thoughts, and then I go, want to go back to Natalia uh, to ask you questions. Just, of course, it's amazing. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Pedro, for the invite. Nice to meet the panel. Nice to see a few members of the panel again. Uh, digital evidence is going to be of the highest uh, magnitude and priority in these cases. I've been working um, with uh, a group called Starling Labs out of Stanford and USC, and they're working on these techniques exactly to try and collect um, and uh, store and, and preserve for longevity what will eventually be used. And there was this great moment last Friday when we were speaking, and I, I saw Natalia, who we haven't met before, but it, I, I, I recognized her because I was thinking, wait a second, I put together a submission for the ICC in June. There was this piece of evidence that we were seeking for, uh, to, to have corroborated. And this wonderful, uh, um, not only was it unfortunate, but this, this, this video was taken and that video was tragic, but the, but the wonderful commentary that was attached to it was done by Natalia. And it was immediate apparent, immediately apparent when I, when I saw her. And I think that, I mean, that speaks to a few things, the importance um, of open source investigations, which is what this, this is, uh, what, we were, what, what we were trying to uh, corroborate was, was a piece of digital evidence, a telecommunications message on Telegram with uh, uh, open source information, but also just the plethora of information that we're gonna have to deal with. The need for it to be preserved is of the highest magnitude now, perhaps unlike in pre pre previous years, because we know the the willingness for Russian accused to use and rely upon fake news. There's a counter narrative in almost everything that we have in society today, especially when you're talking about the Russian Ukraine situation. Um, I'm taking too much time. I'll stop. No, that was great, Scott. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, Natalia, I'm excited. Comment? Yeah, no, we all do. Natalia, any any comments? And then I want to Well, I can just comment that what we are doing is not nothing new to uh, investigation or forensic because video and photo is a part of a criminal process or a procedure for many years. So uh, what we actually can cont contribute is uh, human resources because the prosecutors, the investigators in Ukraine just lack the human resources to, uh, for, to make the uh, documents of air, all, all the atrocities and also um, uh, I think that we are trying to contribute in a, in a forensic quality for example our videos are not edited uh, they are all um, sought to be with a full exif uh, information, GPS, and uh, all, all of that. Uh, also, now we have problems with GPS because some um, liberated areas has no, completely no signal, but still somehow we can address this situation. And uh, also, um, as we are working with the, within the pretrial um, process, um, their investigators and their uh, foreign counterparts because lots of foreign um, counseling is coming to Ukraine from the police of uh, police or maybe other uh, ser services from European countries and not I, I know about some counseling from European countries so um, they are telling us how to improve our reporting in terms uh, that it could be uh, recognizable in any international uh, court. So, for example, I'm trying to uh, put myself into the video. I, I, uh, I, uh, I press the pause, I, I change the camera. So it's one unedited video which shows who did it completely. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, I will not go into much details, but we are trying, we are working in uh, the presumption that the trial, whatever it would be, um, could uh, have the competitive uh, uh, nature. So this would be Russians well, saying that it, it was not ours. So uh, all the time we and the prosecutors and, oh, and the investigators, they are saying do it. So the um, defendant uh, uh, think like a criminal. <laughs> Exactly. Best evidence practice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And Roman, let's turn to you because you do things a little bit differently and your organization Truth Hounds does with, you know, this Bellingcat. We've talked a lot about this. So tell us 
what you do at Truth Hounds, uh, what you're seeing right now in Buka, Isium, or anywhere else, um, and how are investigations different these days? Because you've been working not only in Ukraine, but around the world. Um, so, Roman. Uh, thanks, Pedro, and hello, everyone. Uh, Truth Hounds have been working in a field of uh, grave violations of the international humanitarian law for eight years already, so exactly. Around these days, in 2014, we have launched our first field mission with purpose to document testimonies and to collect and produce videos while being presented at the alleged crime scene. And since then, we have been working in this narrow field of field work. We have by now launched over 100 missions, I believe 125 or so. Last week we have spent the whole week in to Izum and Balaklia area, we just came back from, from these settlements. And our main goal is, of course, the personal criminal responsibility of those who uh, have committed the, the international crime. We're trying to assist Ukrainian justice system in supporting them with materials collected by us and also produced by Truth Hounds documenters while being on a alleged crime scene. Just our documenters becoming a source of evidence for the future or ongoing investigations. Before going to each field mission, as, as for now, we coordinate our plans with prosecutors in, in, in the region. So we held a meeting with Deputy Prosecutor of the Kharkiv region, and also with the head of the investigative unit of the Security Service of Ukraine to basically split our tasks. And we agree that they are doing the whole mapping of all the destructions that have happened during these six months of the occupation of these areas. They, they're using drones, they're using video cameras, and they're just mapping all the impact craters and all the destructions that have been caused by the, all the challenges. And our role was to identify the individuals who potentially could contribute into narrowing down uh, the to, to, to exact incident, to identify incident and to then link the exact impact crater, for instance, with the incident, with the firing position and with the unit that has been deployed to that area and who allegedly launched the attack. So, Besides that, we, of course, doing a lot of other things. We have uh, our own investigative unit and we doing our own investigations. A couple of weeks ago, we have published an investigation of the uh, cruise missile strike on Mikolaev administrative building that killed 34 people who were able to identify the trajectory of the missile, where it was launched from in the, the vessel. Uh, that launched this Kalibr cruise missile and the, the head of the artillery unit on, on this vessel up to, up to this. And also we supply national prosecutors with at least like testimonies because we work in an old school uh, passion. So we put the, the person, the witness, uh, as a, in the center of this. And then while taking the testimony, while identifying the the strikes, then we are able to link them with others. For instance, we have interviewed a woman who, who has been wounded in her leg during the, the attack on the exact day, and we were able to uh, write down, describe the pattern of the attack and how, how the attack was, was developing that day. And that part of the rocket that we, we used to launch the attack uh, fell in, in, in her in her garden while she were she were wounded some 300 meters from that place so we already have some information about how about the direction where the the rocket has has launched from and we're trying to collect all these bits and put and and, and paint the the whole picture of, of it and the the other part of our work is assisting prosecutors and investigating in terms of better understanding the nature of international crime and the how to better document them for future trials for these arguments not to be dismissed um, by court because as natalia told it will be like com competition in the court and if for instance during the primary primary documentation the police 
investigator wouldn't film the crater and then crater would, would be filled with tarmac or soil, it would be extremely hard to prove the, the rocket or the shell came from the direction of the Russian positions, not from Ukrainian ones. So we keeping all this in mind, trying to fill the gaps into the investigation of the Ukrainian official bodies. And of course, we are trying to engage foreigners in terms like both international justice mechanism like the ICC or the foreign investigators into the investigation of the crimes, especially when the victims, survivors of these crimes are residing on their soil, so to launch an investigation on their behalf, trying to pursue people, prosecutors in, in, in Germany, in Norway, in, in Spain, in, in whatever country in the world has this universal jurisdiction mechanism trying to push them and we also have got some already results in this regards regarding the attacks uh, on the Swiss journalist, for instance. So we have filed this submission to Swiss prosecutor about this uh, this attack and also to, to French. No, thank you, Roman. That was exactly my question. So thank you for anticipating uh, my question. And as you said, all evidence is going to be contested in court. I think uh, Andrea and I both work at the at the E Triple C, and it's and I think the judgment, anyways. And Scott also worked in all the tribunals. Every single piece of evidence is going to be contested, and you need to make it as tight as possible. Scott, I wanted to come to you to talk about what you're doing. You've been doing a lot of work for a long time in Ukraine. You, I understand, help uh, draft the the new criminal international statutes in Ukraine. But I wanted to ask you about what Roman just said about individual criminal responsibility. Can you give us and the audience what that means, why it's based? You know, I started this saying, uh, talking about Lviv, where, you know, everything started, basically, that big book by Philip Sands. So modes of liability, very briefly, but also what he just said at the end. You know, I I, I mentioned in, in, in my prepared questions how I went to an event last Friday where the prosecutor general of Ukraine, yeah. Ryan, his deputy, said that I, he thinks that there are at least either 18 or 21 countries right now where there are investigations yep. being pursued right now to hold uh, war criminals accountable for what they're doing in Ukraine. So, Scott. Sure. Just a quick backtrack. I mean, I have been working in Ukraine since 2015 um, and have, helping to reform the, the criminal code. They didn't have such provisions as crimes against humanity that you could prosecute in, in domestically. Um, I'm working with investigators, working with prosecutors, working with uh, judges and then sitting in different uh, commissions to help advance uh, an understanding of international criminal law and inter um, inter international humanitarian law. Roman's point is as strong a point as you can make. You have to do your work when you're investigating to try and identify the individual or company or battalion responsible for the crimes. And it sounds like your team is doing this work with such sophistication that it's going to be of such value whether you submit it to a domestic entity who's contemplating a, a, a universal jurisdiction claim or you're sending it to the ICC or you're sending it to the, to, to the prosecutor general's office in Ukraine because individual criminal responsibility is just that. Collective responsibility isn't a thing. And it becomes very difficult because we spend a lot of our time reading the news we're spending a lot of our time hearing about all these tragedies they are and they need to be punished but you also need to know how to punish the right person and those punishments need to be done uh, in line with prevailing international human rights laws and so while you might want to say the russian state is doing this and the russian state is doing that because the the actors come from that environment it's not that that wouldn't be enough and in in terms of the last question i there, there has been, if, if I've understood it right, stop me if I'm, if I'm starting to go down the wrong path, but yeah, there, there was a statement by the head of the war crimes unit in, in Ukraine last week that 18 to 20 other states were, have initiated some form of, 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 of an investigation. I, yeah. I actually think it's 18 because okay. I did track back and we have our own uh, sort of data track. And um, so they have, three, they have three options. One of them was, well, maybe they were all brought up by, by Roman, but one of them, collect your information, do it uh, with yourself and maybe the assistance of civil society in, in your state or independent investigators uh, like myself, take that information, you can send it to the ICC. But remember the ICC, it is an international court, it sounds big. There's three courtrooms, a limited budget, 
and not that big uh, of, of a staff. And so 99% of prosecutions will be handled domestically. In my respectful view, I think universal jurisdiction cases should be initiated because those 99% of the cases are going to be very difficult to prosecute in Ukraine. It's a hardworking group. They have, even if you boot, even if you bootress the size of their staff, it's a hardworking group that probably can't handle the gravity of crimes in, in Mariupol alone. And so if you can get with universal jurisdiction, for those who are, are less familiar with jurisdictional notions in courtrooms, you have three traditional ways that a court can prosecute somebody. And that's you prosecute because they're, they committed a crime on your territory. You, the, uh, one of your own nationals perpetrated the crime or one of, one of the victims of the crime was a national of your country. But universal jurisdiction transcends that because the gravity of the crimes are so severe. And so you can use the universal jurisdiction mechanism to prosecute genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Now, the, each state has its quirky um, limitations, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this anytime, but any of those states should be able to initiate some UJ um, universal jurisdiction cases, and I suggest they should because of the gravity, breadth, and volume of the crimes that we fear have been committed and uh, allegedly have seen been we, see we, we have allegedly seen already quite a few right. crimes um, perpetrated. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. That, that was super insightful. I want to turn to Andrea and when we weave one of the questions from the Q&A. So everyone in the audience, remember, this is a live panel. You can send your questions through the Q&A. Uh, but uh, I want to turn to Andrea, uh, but I want to give Natalia and Roman or Andrea, if you want to comment on that. If not, um, I have a question for Andrea. Natalia. If I may, a short comment that the crimes are not alleged. The criminal is alleged. Okay. Right. This is, yeah, sort of. And, and that that's yeah, so, sort of my question. But so my question for, for Andrea first and anyone else is so Susanna Sirkin, which I, I understand was a former head of physicians for human rights. She put a question in the chat that we can all see, which is an interesting question, which is not a false equivalence. And she's and she says it right there. Um, but I want to talk about Andrea, about what what Clint said, what Ambassador Van Scott said, and what you said about how these this prosecution is both different between because of, of quality, but also because it's a different kind of war crimes prosecution, right? It's not the victor's justice of Nuremberg. It's not the ICTY with a mandate. It's not ECCC, right? This is different because Ukrainian themselves are asking for it. They're prepared. They're ready to do it. So how is this different? Why, why is this different? How is the work that the ACA is doing, you with Ambassador Williamson and everyone else is doing it? Um, but also, uh, if you see Susanna Sirkin's question about how to, if there were any, and she's not saying there's no false equivalence, if there were any war crimes committed, or if they are, we don't know, or I don't know, crimes committed by the Ukrainian, how do you do that? How do you hold everyone responsible? Uh, and if you want to talk about, you know, modes of collective responsibility, aggression, ICJ, OC, let's talk about that too. But <laughs> let's focus on these first things. Um, so first of all, it's an excellent question. Um, that, <clears throat> that was a very important part of the ICTY's work, um, almost to a detriment of like equivocating everybody. Like, let's look at the Serbs, the Muslims, uh, the Croats, all equally as equal, uh, you know, uh, equally responsible for what happened in Yugoslavia. Even though, for example, there was a CIA report that said 95% of the crimes had been committed by the Serbs. Um, so there is going to be that on the ground um, and the Ukrainians, if they're going to be prosecuting this on their own, there will be that demand that they also look at their own uh, military, if their military committed crimes against um, Russian combatants, against Russian civilians, um, that would of course be um, demanded under any, any uh, form of uh, examination of war crimes. Um, if these cases are taken um, to a separate court, for example, if there's an ad hoc court was being created, that would become a question. How do you look at this? At the moment, what's really amazing about the work that ACA is doing 
is we're focusing on regions. We're going into specific areas and we're looking and saying, what happened here? We have groups of experts involved in um, examining sexual violence during armed conflict. We have groups uh, looking at um, you know, use of chemical weapons uh, during combat. At the ICTY, you had teams going in to look at the Serbs. What did the Serbs do in this village? Another completely separate group going in saying, what did the Croats do in this village? So I believe that this, the, the, the approach that, especially um, somebody, an extreme veteran of one of the first war crimes prosecutors, he was on loan from the US, from the Department of Justice, Clinton Williamson, Ambassador Williamson, um, comes with that expertise to know why that's not the right approach. Why what we're doing in Ukraine, looking regionally to see what happened in this region, um, allows you to have that scope and that breadth and to say, oh yes, these crimes were committed by the Russian forces, but for example, Example, we had a Ukrainian soldier, and I'm not saying that this happened or didn't happen, but a Ukrainian soldier who may have committed um, a crime as well. So let's look and prosecute this as well. Um, so it's it's really changed, and I believe it's due to the what we've learned, lessons learned from 30 years of um, prosecuting war crimes at the ICTY, ICC, ECCC, um, Special Tribunal for Sierra Leone, um, and again, most importantly. What's new here is the um, open source uh, evidence and how we're going to treat that um, beyond any doubt. Um, and the challenge that the content obtained from social media raises of veracity, um, metadata, information about content, as well as non-content details, such as when, where, how the information was collected. It's frequently stripped away and therefore can't be used to corroborate the critical information. That's why what Maria is doing is so important and what Natalia is doing. Um, I think there's a lot of irony in the fact that um, Maria was working in the field of disinformation prior to this, um, because this is really what um, is going to be the attack on, on this open source. So it's imperative to establish standards around the corroboration and verification um, that can help maximize the evidentiary weight of, of the information um, that Maria and um, Natalia and Roman are, are collecting. Um, so I'm sorry to loop back to my... <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> to the I know. Source. No, that's exactly right. And that's that's what we're doing, why, why it's so, so special. Um, I, I wanted to ask the big question, which is how do we prosecute Putin, right? And it's a big question, and Ambassador Williamson was asked this um, in the event with, with Evelyn, with Dr. Farkas, and he said, you know, it's not for us to decide, it's for the Ukrainians themselves and anyone who has jurisdiction, but we'll go where the evidence leads, right? But we have to find that evidence where it leads um, to hold those most responsible. So what you're talking about, Andrea, is also systematizing, right? Because what I understand about the regions and about syst the systematic nature of these grave crimes is that you have to prove systematicity, gravity, and all these, you know, very legal specific things. Uh, but it is possible at some point, right? And he spoke about Milosevic. He spoke about that indictment that he wrote. Um, so how does one, in the end, you know, hold those most responsible and why is that so important? So I'll leave it open uh, if anyone wants to jump at that. Uh, but how does then one do that and, and why is it so important to actually go for those most responsible? I see Scott. Go. I do know that prosecuting political officials tends to be very problematic, uh, difficult, difficult. They tend to be further from the crime scene. The, the, the communications between them are, are sometimes difficult to intercept. I know if you just look at the acquittals over the last decades, especially at um, the ICTY and R, political officials tend to be getting uh, acquitted. Foreign ministers, the foreign minister from uh, North Macedonia, I think the for another foreign, Militinovich, can't remember where he's from. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's more challenging because what you have to prove when you're demonstrating the modes of liability and the, the, the degree to which you have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt makes it a challenge. Whereas if you have a commander on the ground and, and that person is issuing orders and the, 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 the lower ranked soldiers are perpetrating crimes, you have, you have a pretty easy, pa easier path to command responsibility. 
um, for, for a senior. And so these are just the realities, but I, I was reading and I hope, I hope that this anecdote um, is, has, has, a, has at least a semblance of truth. I, I was hearing that um, President Putin is over, overruling his generals and making direct orders in the field. And if, if that has any semblance of truth to it, it should be firmly investigated then that would make the path if we were looking to prosecute um, President Putin um, a lot easier. One quick caveat to that, there still could be challenges in prosecuting him from a universal jurisdiction perspective based on um, prevailing immunity uh, practices and understandings that may be evolving, but it's not probably quite there. But the ICC, those immunities, uh, are, aren't as yeah, you know, and and so we would have a much easier chance. And I, I so I do, yeah. I'll I'll leave it there. And let the rest of the panel give yeah. their. Um, Andrea, thank and so you. I would definitely say that um, in terms of comparing it. So I worked on the Milosevic case. So in comparing it to this, I would see a Putin indictment much easier, mm, um, yeah. without any doubt. Um, both Franja Tujman and um, uh, Slobodan Milosevic used. Uh, special forces. They uh, converted the Yugoslav National Army into Republika Srpska Krajina and Hrvatska Vojna o Obrana, which were both creations within Bosnia, but really being funded and fueled by Serbia or by Croatia. So here we have the Russian army <laughs> commanded by Putin, and you have the de, de facto, his statements uh, yeah, uh, you do have, uh, 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 Natalia, you're also right, there's the Wagner group, there's many also, he's doing many similar things. Um, you have um, the de facto, but you also have to look at the de jure. What is the command structure in the laws of Russia, uh, of, the, of him, of Putin, over um, the military, over the special forces? So it is, I think... I think in a, in a lot of ways, um, uh, the Russian um, uh, writer, Masha Gessen, has written a lot about how the um, attacks by NATO on Serbia were sort of what fueled a lot of this response by Putin. And I think a lot of his lessons and a lot of his statements about um, coming into with his peacekeepers, all of these quotes are sort of little jabs towards, you know, this beautiful Russian irony uh, of, um, of uh, uh, towards NATO, um, of what NATO did in Kosovo um, and in Serbia. So yeah, I, I personally do see more um, direct command with Putin than I uh, ever saw with uh, Milosevic. Wow. I saw more with Tuchman, in fact. Wow, wow, that's great. Natalia and Roman, yeah. If I may, I want to command that, uh, in my opinion, we should go up into the chain of commands, definitely. And But there are serious problems because most of the crimes we see here in Kharkiv are airstrikes. So to trade there commands how who presses the button who tell them how uh, and, and their russian uh, society and their uh, russian army is a very close group so i i have no idea how we can deal with it without whistleblowers or without some uh, top generals uh, imprisoned or escaped who are given some testimonies but still those testimonies can be easily contested so it's for me it's a very big problem i want also to comment on the question about uh, prosecuting ukrainian alleged ukrainian crimes uh, we have the big problem that there are no external monitoring agencies in ukraine and it's not our uh, fault all those international agencies which were presumed to monitor human rights violations, blah, 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 they are not here. Mm. Well. And uh, to address all those concerns, we definitely need outsiders. Yeah. Some third party which we can trust, which well, whatever the uh, parties trust, but, uh, but since Russia is a part of uh, all those treaties, all those uh, OSC, UN, and so on, obviously they are blocking any missions or any investigation and so on. So that is a big problem, I think. Yeah, no, wow, thank you. Uh, Roman, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, but I also have another question if you want to talk, if you want me to ask it. 
Uh, well, I maybe will address Natalia's concerns about problem with taking put into responsibility. I will give you one specific example from my own experience. Last May, we've been to Eastern Donetsk region settlement, and we received a report that that night, allegedly, not allegedly, but it, 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 it was definitely part of a group of Ukrainian troops who fired shots uh, into the direction of uh, Russian held positions or separatist positions using the uh, automatic grenade launcher. And doing, while doing this, they obviously have put civilians living in the settlement in danger because they, they didn't go to the field. And we contacted, we actually visited the head of the of the brigade and asked him about this incident. And he told like, why? Like we, as the Ukrainian army, we always uh, act in line with the IHL and we don't put civilians in danger. I will take this incident. And I will investigate this. Uh, I have already already reacted into this before our visit he had another visitor from the security service of ukraine so this <clears throat> relatively small incident in comparison to all the uh, atrocities that have like, that are committed dur during the the warfare was uh, wasn't leave uh, without proper reaction while only a reaction of, of putin or any commander of russian troops after they committed these all huge crimes in the in Bucha or Irpin and all over the all, all over our country, was only to put medals on their chests. Uh, I mean, clear lack of proper action, pro proper reaction on the and, and, and through this they just encouraging them to continue the, these atrocities that we have seen here in the newly liberated areas after all the atrocities uh, that have been re revealed in in early april after the liberating of sume and chernihi and Kyiv region have been revealed to the world no single change of the behavior of the of the russian soldiers have have, have, have recorded by have been recorded by us they just continue to act the same brutal way in in terms of Grave violations of the HL. They have captured civilians. They have tortured them. They killed them. And all the like, you can just open the Article Eight of the Rome Statute and give me uh, like name me a crime, and I will will give you this specific example only from my personal experience. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Roman. Um, I actually wanted to go back to that because Andrea mentioned it and uh, Ambassador Van Skak mentioned it at the beginning, right? And and to name things by what they are. And she talked about castration, for example, sexual violence against women and girls, uh, the amount of people that have been executed point blank with their hands behind their backs, right? We've, as I understand it, we've actually already seen evidence that there are war crimes being committed and crimes against humanity, possibly. And she mentioned two studies one i think which was just presented and the yale university one where i think they're using five different independent uh evidence um submissions to substantiate one element of each crime or one right so it's it's being used and as she said at the beginning and as we're saying it's become both the most documented war crimes uh seen in history uh, but it's also creating a whole ho host of legal problems i wanted to go quickly back to one two questions in the chat one reminder audience this is a live uh q a you can send them as they are um and i wanted to ask uh whoever wants to talk about this uh but i want to go back to to the two ukrainians that we have here to talk about capacity building from the bottom up so Right, because you know we lawyers, or at least me, I'll put, I'll speak for myself. You know, we think we know what's best, but that's never the case, right? It's about what Andrea and Scott have been doing for many, many years, right? Building capacity so that these things never happen again. So the question in the chat, anonymously, remember people can ask anonymous or questions um, with their names. The anonymous question, which is the big picture question, again, just so we all have it in mind. I think everyone spoke a little bit about this, but the question is, what are the current plans on how to best prosecute Russian war crimes? So there's, there, I'll start to answer it. Then it goes, which has more success? 
the, a UN treaty with Ukraine, so sort of like the ECCC uh, or a hybrid court. Uh, Clint, Ambassador Williamson spoke about this, about how there might be very compelling arguments for an international hybrid court, but the realities might be insurmountable. It seems it's going to be domestic prosecutions uh, and some kind of universal jurisdiction. We already spoke about this, and there's you know the I, the the ICJ, the ICC, uh, and maybe some criminal court on aggression, maybe, uh, but I don't know anyone who has any thoughts on that. Uh, who who has thoughts on that? If not, I'll do. Scott. Sure. Yeah. I mean, an ad hoc could be possibly contemplated, but even in that event, I, Andrea, you may know the total number, but I think the total number of those prosecuted at the ICTY was still only about 180. Um, ICTR was less than 200, I believe. I think Sierra Leone was 12. My point is, even if we had a standalone and, and we didn't necessarily work um, in line with what I was saying at the ICC, where, where there's only three courts, maybe you can prosecute 30 people over uh, 10, 15 years, keeping in mind speedy trial requirements. A lot of this will have to be done domestically. Um, the, this, this standalone court relating to, that, relating to the crime of aggression is anomalous to the rest of these crimes that we're speaking of. And that's gained support recently from the EU, um, the European Parliament, if I'm not mistaken, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And so that's gaining some steam, but you, you, you'll have to set up some, maybe you can set up a special, I think, and maybe I, I'd, I'd have to defer to Andre on this as well. I think Bosnia set up some form of um, standalone tribunal within its domestic system to just work on prosecuting these crimes. So that might be an option as well, because even, even if we look at U, uh, universal jurisdiction cases, they're not going to be take, uh, taking on the vast number of persons who might need to be prosecuted. Yeah, and Andrea and then Natalia? Well, um, I'm not an, uh, like, oh, sorry, Andrea, please. <laughs> Natalia, go. Okay, I'm not a legal expert, but I'm a dreamer. Uh, so my dream would be the ideal tribunal, ideal court would be set by Russian people to demand their uh, responsibility from their leaders for all those already dead people, for all the costs which are and will be imposed into Russia. So in my opinion, it would be the best case. Well, now it sounds like a fantastic, of course, but who knows? No, that's exactly right. And that, that answers the comment that Stephen Fodor put in the Q&A, that we can collect evidence on war crimes that we need the Russian people to speak to the Kremlin uh, and do it themselves. Um, Scott, you had a comment or, or should I keep going? Well, maybe just one small comment that I do think when we're talking about prosecuting Ukrainians as, as, uh, as well, if we find out that crimes have been perpetrated, I'll, I'll just step back and say we did spend years um, trying to revising IHL manuals for the military, working on their field manuals with very credible partners and training the military police of the Ukrainian armed forces. And that work should help to address, um, I, I, I would hope, a, a number of the, and, and, and fully apprised of the responsibilities, uh, even more so after some of the, the, the work that we've done. And so, but in, 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 in general, yes, both sides were, have to be uh, contemplated if, if, if uh, allegations of crimes are made and substantiated. Yeah, I think that that position of neutrality is super important. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the earlier question um, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, the long arc of justice, right? We always speak about this phrase and how the arc of justice bends, the, the arc of history bends towards justice, right? But I always say that it's us, we who have to will it. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how it would work to prosecute Putin, but the reality, what might be that we might end up, hopefully, hopefully it won't take, you know, 80 years like the Nazis that are still being prosecuted. Hopefully it's soon. Hopefully it's, it's quick. Hopefully 
Putin is indicted soon, so he can't travel, right? Or his generals um, that we're seeing live accountability right now. But um, anyone, uh, maybe Andrea, do you want to comment a little bit about what the ACA is advising? Like, what, 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 why is the ACA? Clint, Ambassador Williamson told us a little bit at the beginning, uh, and Ambassador Manscock, of course, but what, how, how does it work and why is this so important? And what's the end goal here? How, how do we think about what? you know, redress at the end, victim-centered, you know, how do we do it? So the first thing I would say is um, just going back to the idea of an ad hoc court, um, sort of setting up a Ukraine war crimes court, first of all, the difficulty with dealing with Russia still being on the Security Council, no comment. <laughs> um, but um, also, this is the first time I've heard mention of an ad hoc in a very long time. Nobody wants them. Um, they're very, very expensive. They rarely get, uh, as, as Scott said, um, from the Bosnian war, large amounts of the lower level cases were shifted back to Bosnia to prosecute. Um, I think they're still being prosecuted. Um, and they do have, tend to have a smaller um, reach. So that's why there's this big push on um, enabling the Ukrainians. And that's where the ACA comes in. Um, as Pedro, as you well know, we started this out as a very small rule of law project in Ukraine that just grew um, because of the war um, into the transatlantic response. Um, the, the goal and the final goal is to enable uh, Ukrainian prosecutors and investigators and analysts um, by bringing in people who have been doing this for 30 years and saying, this is what you need to look for. Um, and hopefully we will bring the expertise on how you deal with open source and how you, how you handle this so that it's reliable and can't be challenged or tampered with um, in Ukrainian courts. Um, so that is, that is the, um, the mission of the ACA. Will it be enough. I mean, the, the extent of the crimes, as as Roman said, I mean, it's basically uh, ticking off every Geneva Convention violation, every you know hate convention. You can go through what it's just checklists of of crimes uh, from the start of this um, operation. So, and perhaps combining it, enabling the Ukrainians, and then building an ad hoc that is outside uh, and can look at. Uh, the, the situation and take only just the leadership or look only at the crime of aggression um, and keep it focused to that. Um, but again, this is the first time um, I worked for, I think, almost a decade uh, trying to help uh, in Liberia um, to have a, a court to examine the crimes that happened at the same time as the crimes in Yugoslavia. So they haven't dealt with that. They had a Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And it, without having this examination, be it from an ad hoc or internally, your country can't move forward. Liberia has been stuck in a way that um, Sierra Leone wasn't because Sierra Le Leone asked for that. It asked for the you know, international community to come in and bring them justice. Um, so they've advanced much further politically, economically um, than Liberia was able to. So it's essential that this is done, but whether it's done um, domestically by strengthening Ukraine and whether that's even possible to this extent um, or whether it should come to an ad hoc, I think is all, is all gonna be unraveling in the next year or years. Yeah, thank thank you, Andrea. And then in the next in the last nine minutes, we have I wanted to to slowly start to wrap it up, but but also give Natalia um, and Roman the chance to tell us and tell the world and tell the prosecutors here uh, what you need from us, what you've been learning from people like who work on the ACA, like Andrea and Scott and everyone else, um, and why this is important for for you personally. If you want to share any personal stories. Um, so uh, maybe we'll start in the opposite order. So Roman, do you want to go first and then Natalia? Oh, thank you, Pedro. Um, so to, maybe I will speak more in, in, in general terms, not about our own needs, but what to need to be done for the war crimes to be decreed in this, uh, in this war. We have figured out the, the two ways inside our, our team that one of the most effective way and maybe the only way to decrease the level of war crimes being committed during this uh, warfare is to literally knock out a rifle of the hands of Russian soldier. Because if Russian soldier will held uh, a gun in his hand, 
people shoot civilians. Uh, they they will use it to commit war crimes. So the the essential point is, is to support Ukraine up to to help it win this war and to repel the the invaders off the territory of Ukraine. Because while many settlements, Ukrainian settlements, uh, are being occupied now, huge number of atrocities are being committed still against. Ukrainian civilians against uh, those who are willing to, to speak Ukrainian, those who are not betraying uh, the, the, the motherland. And another one is like it's it's not the only problem is uh, to identify the the suspects. The problem uh, will be to hold them responsible to literally put them uh, behind the bars. And I think that this. Uh, we believe uh, of all the soldiers serving in, in Russian army that they would never be extra extradited from the Russian territory to to be uh, put to the to the courtroom uh, is encouraging them to continue their brutal. Behavior. I think that the the whole world would start now the rhetoric that after Ukraine will win the war and after all the reparations are being paid by Russia, no single sanction can be lifted until Russia uh, signs, like agrees to extradite the suspects of the alleged war crime. And if this rhetoric will be presented now in, a, in the in an informational field, maybe this would this make all the soldiers to think of their, their actions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you speak about deterrence and about how, as an, an Ambassador Williamson also mentioned it, that we need, you know, a military victory and and and, and a military and a military victory conducted under the loss of war, right? And so, I, I think, oh, we lost someone. I think Scott had to go, um, or he's coming back, or the Russians got to us because he's in he's <laughs> in Georgia, but. Uh, the cost of I, I I wrote a little article about the cost of liberation army right and 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 I what I understand but Andrea would know more is or anyone else here would know more is that most of that war to liberate Kosovo was done under the loss of war and there were war crimes committed by the KLA and I think the head is now at the Hague surrender himself voluntarily but th there has to be a war of liberation right we need to to think again about freedom fighters um, and what that means as Roman said. And also, more importantly, and what we're talking about today, Roman, as you said, deterrence, right? We need to stop people from committing war crimes. We need to do it now. We've tried since 1945. It still is happening. We still need to keep trying. So the arc of history bends. Uh, Natalia. Well, I'm sitting and I live literally 40 kilometers from the border with Russia. So even stopping the war, winning the war does not safeguard me personally from being hit by a rocket flown from the territory of Russia. So it's not that easy. Uh, um, for me, the ultimate goal of the justice is to get the Russian society to accept the responsibility for the war. In my opinion, uh, maybe starting from the top up, this is a hierarchy of society, so at least the political elite should accept their responsibility. Uh, for that, we need external expertise, because we did not have such an expertise in our history uh, that could be counseling, there could be external resources as Ukraine doesn't have such resources. For example, our NGO is being now supported by a British private fund, Crown Agent International De Development, which allows us to uh, buy fuel, to go on a long road, to go, for example, on a big trip to resume to make photos with two drones and so on and so on. So basically we, we need uh, advice, we need experts, we need this some type of a third party observers here, I think they, in my opinion. Um, and we need some really clever people like those who established the Nuremberg trial who could be able to do it in which form, I don't know. I'm still, I'm a, I am became a war um, reporter just uh, seven months ago, and I'm just learning the legal procedures. I've read the Berkeley Protocol, and um, but we are not working with an open source uh, resources. We are working with 
and photos and videos we are making. So we are designing how to do it, how to um, take the evidence which can be used even in Russian courts. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. And, and we lost Scott. I, I said, Scott, when you left that the Russians finally hacked us. So I'm glad that wasn't the case. They didn't get me. They didn't, you know, they didn't find us. No, sorry so, about that. Just no, uh, tech, tech malfunction. No worries. Your closing comments and we'll finish with Andrea um, about what you're doing, what, what you need from us, uh, what you, anything. Sure. Well, we're working here in Tbilisi interviewing refugees who may have not had as loud a voice because they've departed and have gone to places. There are some, there are some CS, uh, civil society organizations providing support, but in my experience, it's insufficient to actually fully canvas and document the, 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 the potential war crimes that have taken place. I would on, only then next say, um, this has been a really great event for me. It's great to meet um, s some of you and, and, and see you again, Pedro. Uh, what, what, what's needed is just for this collective effort to continue. If, if you have any capacities in the humanitarian, providing humanitarian assistance, provide it. If it's your, if it's your strength to work on accountability, work on accountability and help this effort move forward because there, there are enough crimes that will be documented for leadership to be put in prison for many, many years, but it's not really the point. We want the, we want the victims to have their justice in the courtroom at the time when it's necessary to do so. And just one last comment, be patient. These, these, these processes take time. Um, part of it is because we're, we're, we're collecting, and, and especially Roman, the, the likes of Roman and Talia during an active conflict. And the, the, the wheels of justice don't spin as fast sometimes as you would like. And that is partly because we do uh, accord fair trial rights to the accused. And these are important notions that we celebrate. Even if you watch Russian courtrooms, they're not celebrating as much as they ought to. And so... Yeah, I guess that, and just just to, to thank everyone um, for who, who attended and, and uh, were offering their 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 questions to us. Thank you, Scott. Andrea, I'd just very quickly. Um, I I would just make two points. The first one, really in support of um, what Natalia said, is that it's essential that we also continue to support the Russians who are dissenting and who are now hiding in Latvia and wherever, um, who are civil society, human rights activists who want the, uh, this war to end and do not support, and that there are Russians who do not want this. Um, and as much as they can be supported, we'll get closer to, as Natalia's dream, a trial in Russia. Um, but at the same time, uh, just echoing Scott's People are never happy after after any of these courts, be it a decision by the ICC, by it, be it 20 years of, of ICTY work where nobody's happy in the end. The Serbs say it was against them, the Croats say it was against them, uh, the prosecutions were against them. It's more important at the end, and, and we can see where those countries are now and what has happened. It's more important in the end that there was an attempt at justice, be it an attempt by domestic prosecutors or universal jurisdiction or ad hocs, that there was an attempt rather than there was no attempt, that we let this all happen and, and didn't, that ACA wasn't created or that, you know, that the ICC wasn't looking at these crimes. So I don't think everybody's going to be like, this was a great success, Each on, on, everybody will be saying that, but um, the attempts that are being made now for justice are what's important, what's essential. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Natalia, Roman, Andrea and Scott for joining our discussion today. Your answers and comments were very thoughtful, insightful and strategic, just as we expected that the world's need more leaders such as yourself. I think Senator McCain would have been proud of the work you're doing to prosecute those ultimately responsible for committing atrocity crimes in Ukraine and around the world. Thank you as well, Dr. Farkas, for the great interview with Ambassador Williamson and to Ambassador Van Skak for opening this event. And thank you, our audience, for tuning in today. I want to quickly thank my colleagues, Luke, Paul, Barov, and Anna, as well as Cole, Patrick, Stacey, and Amy, and Megan. This sounds like the Oscar. I'm sorry, but this was a huge <laughs> event. 
<laughs> thank you. Uh, and may we see justice for Ukraine in our lifetimes. Thank you again. <laughs>